Just to give you a little brief, Megan Brooks is the Chief Investigator and a sworn, sworn excuse me, law enforcement officer for the Will County State's Attorney's Office, um, High Tech Crimes Bureau. She told me not to read everything about her. It's amazing. <laughs> everything is in the program. But one of the most important things is Megan is also a um, single mom and um, on the front lines with her students or with her children as well, just like you are um, at home. So I think that's really important to come uh, here and hear somebody that is in the same shoes you are. So if you could please welcome Megan Brooks. Social networking. If they have devices, my assumption is that they're on social networking. These are some 
um, pictures of some apps that you might have seen on your child's device. And how many of us have good kids? Our kids are basically good kids, right? I have good kids. All of our kids are good, right? So, and how many of you out there with our good kids think that our kids tell us everything? My kid's a good kid, he tells me everything. Okay, we got one. Anybody else? Your kids tell you everything? Basically? Okay, well, my only question back is, everybody sitting there, did you ask yourself this question? Did you tell your parents everything? No. No. <laughs> and so it's not any different for your kids as it was for, for you and for me and everybody else. We're, your kids are not going to tell you everything. And they're especially not going to tell you stuff when they're, when they're not safe and when they think that they're going to get in trouble. And so if I can offer one piece of advice, and that is to stay tight with your kids' best friend. Because if your kid has a best friend, that best friend is going to come to you if that best friend has a relationship with you. And that best friend, if they are a good friend, is going to let you know that your child is in some kind of trouble or danger or is doing risky behavior, whatever it may be. So don't shut out your kids' friends. They need to be a part of your family just as, as tight as you are with your own child. You need to be as tight with their best friends because that's where you're going to find out the information when you need to find it out. Okay, quick video. <laughs> The teenage brain, a mystery that has confounded parents for generations. Everyone wants to know what exactly is going on in those heads. Researcher Yolda Woods had the same question, but fast forward to 2014 and she's using social media to try to tap into what they're thinking. I want you to write down on your boards what is an important value to you for your future. She went one-on-one -on -one with teenagers in Los Angeles, trying to unlock that mystery. What's important to them? What are their priorities? What do they want? Turn over your board and show us what it is. It used to be teenagers' number one priority was to be part of the crowd, part of the community. Now, it's money. And that four-letter word, fame. Chelsea Trotty is 10, and what rocks her world is this. Making small films and waiting for the likes for her social media friends. It's all about the likes. Well, it feels really good to know that people appreciate my work because I put a lot of work into them and stuff. And so, and when they don't like it, I kind of feel bad. <laughs> What's it like to be you and famous? Well, it's like I'm in the midst of you. Oh my gosh. And you know, I'll just be really cool. <laughs> so they all pay attention to you. Yeah. Difference with these grade six kids in Canada. Okay, let's see hands up for iPads and iPods. Who does texting? Or Instagram? Okay. On Instagram, people can comment like on your photos, like, oh, you look really pretty and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, these kids love their likes too. Gives you a good feeling when someone likes the picture. I like it when people like my pictures, it makes me feel and that's not all. The online world today's teenagers are living in may bring them the fame and fortune they crave, but it can also bring heartbreak and bullying. Amanda Todd, Matea Parsons, Jamie Hubley. The list of victims grows. The dark side of the wire world. But neuroscientists in BC may have found answers in science. When you're engaged with your phone or something external, these areas that are involved in daydreaming and thinking about your own thoughts and feelings shut off. The answers may be in the brain. See that blue area of the brain? That's the area that learns empathy. What they found is that those areas that learn empathy are only active when you do nothing, when you daydream. And that's something today's teenagers don't do. Kids are constantly engaged with their technology, their phones and the internet 
but they're not activating these brain areas that are important for self-reflection and reflecting on other people and allowing that empathy to emerge. Do you guys daydream? Do you ever just kind of watch the clouds go by and not think about anything in particular? Yeah. How much time do you think you spend doing that daydreaming? Like 30 seconds a day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so basically most of the time sport and organized activities yeah. that I I'm always on the go, I don't have a lot of time. And if no daydream means no empathy, we could be developing a generation that cares less about other people. You're online and bullying. You don't get these cues that tell you, I need to inhibit this behavior that's having such a negative impact on another person. And therefore, it makes it very easy for bullying to continue. But what worries parents and experts alike is how these fundamental changes to the way teenagers' brains are wired is going to change the way they live in their wired world. Pauline Day, CBC News, Los Angeles. So interesting little tidbit. So it's interesting that our kids need to daydream, right? And in this world, they're busy with sports, they're busy with homework, they're busy, 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 and they're busy on their devices. So they really need to be able to set those devices down and they need to sometimes just sit around and do nothing. It's okay. Okay, so homework for parents. So how many of you in the room, when your kid gets home from school, you ask them if their homework's done? Got your homework done? How many spot check it? Okay, so most of us, right? If, 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 at least we ask them if their homework's done. So the question is, all of us do that. We all ask our kids, and how much time do we think our do we think how many of you think that your kids spend more time on homework or on their phone? How many homework? More time on their homework? How many think more time on their devices? Right. Okay, so you are correct. Most kids spend more time on their devices than they do on their schoolwork. Which brings us, and this is kind of a pictures that I snapped. Um, I got these off Google, but this is kind of what our kids look like. I go to pick up my child at school, and these all the kids are up against the wall, and they have their devices. So the question for the parents, and I asked myself this question. And I, I, I decided to do it. I've got a seventh grader and I've got a sophomore. My sophomore is not on social media, but my seventh grader is a female and she's, you know, social butterfly. So how many of us, if we're asking our kids if they're done with their homework, do we sit down and we ask our kids, hey, show me how this app works? Because I can give you guys handouts on the newest apps, but maybe the app that your child is on isn't on that handout. And maybe tomorrow are, there's going to be a new app that isn't on that handout. So the best way to find out what your child is doing is to sit down with them like you would sit down and help them with their homework and flip the script on them and have them show you how that works. Not in a, in a um, disciplinary fashion like you're going to show me, but hey, I really am interested in how this app works and I need you to show me how to do it. It, is, it worked so well for me. It was a confidence builder with my daughter. She was really happy that she knew something that I didn't. Um, and so, and it was a bonding time for us because she got to show me how Snapchat works. And then while she was showing me how Snapchat works, guess what else I was able to see? Everything that was going on on Snapchat. <laughs> so, I mean, and that was an eye opener for me. Some of the kids that I thought were really good kids were actually Eddie Haskell's, you know? You see the language and you see how different kids are on Snapchat than they are in real life. Um, and, and I learned about Snapchat. And, and every kid is different and boys might be on different apps than girls and vice versa. There's another app that's called Roblox. I don't know anything about it, but I know kids are on it. Um, and so my advice to you is to figure out what apps your kids are using and sit them down and have them teach you how they're being used. Um, okay, next thing. How many kids, how many of your kids go to bed with their devices because they use it as an alarm clock? Excuse, right? I gotta gotta have my phone because I gotta use it for an alarm clock. Well, what we did at one school, um, 
was they, we asked, you can buy an alarm clock for $5 on Five Below. And so we asked the parents to do a challenge, and, and the kids too. Hey, let's do this challenge, let's, and I did it with my child, and she said that she would only do it if I bought this charger right here, because it was really cool. So I said, that's fine, it was 38 bucks, I bought it on Amazon. And so what we do is we have a family charger now, and we charge all the phones in my room, and we said, let's just try it for two weeks and see if it works. And I went to Five Below and I let her pick out a $5 alarm clock. So that took care of the alarm clock situation. And in the morning of the first two weeks, and we don't do it anymore, but every morning we, and, and I did it with my phone too, we went over who Snapchatted you in the middle of the night from, from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Let's go through your Snapchats and let's go through your messages. And it's amazing how many kids are Snapchatting in the middle of the night? And what do kids, we just learn, what do kids need most? Sleep, right? Because their brains are developing. But these kids aren't sleeping. So um, I don't really know. And the other thing that you might learn, and what I learned, is there are other devices that are in your children's rooms that they can get online with, like Nintendo DS's and iPods. And so, just because their phone is charging in your room doesn't mean that they're not in your room on the device in the middle of the night. So, just a suggestion that you could try. Um, it was kind of a fun thing for me to do because I didn't know if my, if my kid was on the, on the phone in the middle of the night or not because I'm in my bed sleeping and she's in her bedroom sleeping. And so, and it was interesting to see who was, and you know, they chat about, they Snapchat about nothing. So it's just, it's kind of crazy. But anyway, okay, so moving on. So now I'm going to give a few examples of some cases that we did, um, and we learned a lot about these cases. And so these are, this is what Jim Glasgow wants us to do. We want to push this information out to you people so that you know the reality of what's out there. So this was a Plainfield case. So this was right kind of in your backyard. And it started out as a child pornography case where I observed um, this predator downloading child pornography um, from some, a network that I use in my office. And we go and I find out who it is, find out where he lives, and we all go out with the Will County Sheriff's Department and we execute a search warrant on the home. And we find this 26-year-old man who lives there and he works at the local Best Buy and he's an Xbox Live player, he likes gaming, and he is on the uh, application Uvu. And so, does that, everybody know what Uvu is? Show hands now. Okay, Uvu is like uh, FaceTime or Skype, so it's a video chat. But it's a video chat, it's a little bit different in that you can uh, talk to several people and do video chatting. We've had issues in schools with kids video chatting on this site, and we had an issue here. Um, so we go to the house and in our minds it's a regular child pornography, even though that doesn't seem regular to you. It's a regular child pornography case, but when we get in there, the forensic examiner finds a bunch of videos on this guy's computer that appear to be local kids and, and videos of, of kids that, that are known to the area. And so we dig a little deeper um, and what we find out <coughs> about this gentleman is that when he would go in to work at Best Buy, he would work in the gaming section. And he was an Xbox Live guy. And so what do you do when you go into Best Buy with your child? Your child separates from you and goes to the gaming section. And there he was, unbeknownst to everybody. And so he met this little boy that we'll call Little Johnny. And he's, they exchanged gaming tag numbers. And then he would approach Little Johnny's mom and say, hey, just so you know, I exchanged gaming tag numbers with your child. Is that okay if we game? together on Xbox Live when I get off work. And Mom was very pleased that he was so polite, and she said, thank you for letting me know, and yeah, that's no problem. And so, off they go. But, this gentleman wasn't um, done yet. He was very polite and tells Mom, and by the way, I get a 20% discount at Best Buy, so if you see anything you like, let me know. Mom wants a new refrigerator. How does it happen, how do I get it? He said, let me buy it and I'll bring it to your house. So how does he get the refrigerator to the house? He has to give up the address, right? So now he's got one more piece of information. He's got little Johnny's gaming tag number and he's got an address. And he goes home and they start gaming. 
And what else does he do? He asks little Johnny, where are your parents at? Little Johnny says, oh, my parents are getting a divorce. They're fighting all the time. They're never home. Okay, so what does that tell the predator, right? Ding, 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 it's perfect target. Parents are never home. You hungry? Would you like a pizza? How about if I send a pizza over to your house? Do you need help eating the pizza? And the next thing you know, he's over at the house. What else does he do? He goes on to Facebook and he friends little Johnny on Facebook. And who else is little Johnny friends with on his Facebook and his Snapchat, right? A bunch of other 12 to 15 year old little boys. So now he's not just friends with one 12 year old boy, he's got all of his friends. And the other thing he did is he looked up his last name on Facebook and he found boys. This, this particular guy was interested in boys from the ages of 12 to 15. So he found 12 to 15 year old boys with his same last name and convinced them that he was related to them and then became friends with them. And so when you're asking your kid and you're going through their Snapchat and their Instagram and you're saying, hey, do you know this person? How do you know this person? Well, these kids would say, well, yeah, that's so-and-so's cousin's brother's uncle. But do you know them? Have you met him in person? Because there's only one kid that really met this guy in person, and that's the kid that went into Best Buy. But sometimes kids will say that they know somebody when they've never really met them. So takeaways, asking for your password. I, when I give the same presentation to kids at school that I'm giving to you, so when somebody asks for your password, you don't give it to them. I tell kids that all the time, not even your best friend, because your best friend today might not be your best friend tomorrow, and what are they going to do with your password? They're going to get on your Snapchat, and they're going to exploit you. Asking about your personal information. So when a kid is online gaming, and he's all involved in gaming, he, they're asking him questions, and he's, not, he's trying to game, and and other people are asking him questions, and so he's giving out personal information. Where's your mom and dad? Oh, they're not home, they're spying, they don't care about me. And so don't ever give out personal information. Switching from gaming to social media, we already went through that. He got more victims that way. And asking for pics. So um, some kids know this, some kids don't, depends on the age, but a pic has a double meaning. So if somebody that you've never met is asking you for a pic, online that usually means they're asking you for an inappropriate picture or a nude. Um, other words that I just learned last week, um, they're teenagers are calling these, these pictures trades. And that's where you actually know somebody that you go to school with and you do a trade, which means I'm going to send you a picture of myself naked and now you send me a picture of, of yourself and that's, a, that's what they're calling trades now. Um, so times are changing and asking to send gifts. That's pizza, he would send uh, Best Buy gift cards to both parents and the child. Um, so those are all red flags. Doesn't always mean that something bad's going on, but I try and tell kids that these red flags should be going off in your head if you're gaming and you're on social media and these things are happening. Okay, another case that we did, Lockport 2014. This was a freshman in high school. We were just at this kid's school two weeks prior to this case breaking. He's on a social media app and he's talking to who he thinks is this hot chick and he thinks she's pretty hot, he likes her, she asks him to switch over to social media, do you have a kick? He says yes. She sends him two nude images of herself, he thinks that's pretty cool. She comes back with the you owe me one pick. He obviously knows what she's talking about because he just got two nude pictures of her and he sends her one nude image and then his nightmare begins. And how that happens is she tells him that she wants more nude pictures of him and a nude video. And at that point, his red flag goes off. And he goes and his heart sinks and he realizes what's happening. And he goes and gets his mom and dad. And he's embarrassed. And his mom and dad call the Lockport Police Department. And then they call us. And we send off his bad guy's IP address. And this girl is actually this guy a registered sex offender out of Michigan. So, just as easy as girls can be exploited, boys are exploited. Um, sometimes we find boys are exploited more so than girls anymore. But, you know, we were one picture too late, right? He sent that picture to this guy. This guy's now in prison, um, as well as the other guys in prison too. Um, but it just goes to show 
that sometimes when we think we're talking to somebody that we know, it's not that person at all. And there are people out there who have really bad intentions. Okay, and this is an application um, that I just became aware of this year. So the guy that develops the computer software that I use to catch predators developed this app. And it's a free app, and you can go and you can download it tonight or whenever you want. It's called Send This Instead. This is not the answer to your children's problems, but it's a tool that they can have in their toolbox. And what it does is it provides them with an out, okay? What we're learning from kids is, um, that obviously their brains aren't developed. And so what we're hearing from kids is, well, I'm going to send them a nude picture because I really like this guy. And if I don't send them a nude picture of myself, then so-and-so down the road is going to send them one, and he's going to like her more. And so that's really where their mind is at. And so they're under pressure because they want to be liked and they want to be accepted. So this is an app that is full of these memes with snarky, um, knows, giving them a no in a humorous way, and maybe that guy will think you're funny, and he'll still like you, and you can say no in a, in a funny, snarky way instead of just saying no. So, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's an idea that this um, computer developer came up with, and he will also, you know, and it, I, I tell the kids when I give them this application, that you can make up your own after you look at all these and you're on a roll, you might be able to think of some funnier um, ways to say no. So, like I said, it's just a tool for your toolbox and, and it'll help them. The other tool is that you can tell your children too. If somebody asks them to send a nude, you can always say, my mom and I go over my phone every night and I can't because she can find my deleted pictures and she'll see it, and she knows she's got spyware on my, on my phone. Um, that's another out. So, um, going back to, uh, I, I let kids know that the digital world isn't any, is, shouldn't be any different than the real world. We wouldn't walk into Starbucks, get our latte, and turn around and sit down at a table full of people that we don't know and start talking to them about our personal life. And it shouldn't be any different in the digital world. Um, I mean, it's just that simple. But it's so easy to do it because you're behind a screen and you think you're anonymous. Okay, how many athletes, how many people do we have here where the kids are in athletics? Okay. okay I'm going to show a quick video on, on social media and athletics. You have to think like a pro as a human being at an earlier age. You have a brand that you're selling that you and we look at it in recruiting. It's amazing how many kids in recruiting will put things out there that, quite frankly, five years ago, ten years ago, we didn't know about them. And now we do. And it's a topic of conversation. And to think that we're not going to find it out is, is just, it's naive. And it's hard for the parents because, you know, it used to be Facebook was real easy, right? Well, Facebook's for old people now. You know, if you're on Facebook, you're old. You know, and Twitter is going that way in a hurry. You know, and well, on Snapchat, and you're never going to be able to find it. Well, we outsource our monitoring of, of our social media, and they can find it. And I'm not going to say the team in the league that I did my research with, but they have a social media media coordinator. He's Ivy League trained, IT, that has a position coach basically monitoring all the top draft picks across the board by their social media history and trends. And it, what came up to me in the, in the study is, is this is going to make or break guys in the draft. If all things are equal, one area where you're not equal is your social media behavior. And why? Because you're naive enough to tell them that that's what you're doing. And just because you think I didn't friend you and I blocked you or whatever it may be, we can find your friends. And through your friends, we can find out what you do and who you associate yourself with. And unfortunately, at least at Northwestern, I don't want to speak right other college coaches, if I go one step further than normal, I have to ask the position coach, the recruiting coach, why are we recruiting you? I don't quite understand how he fits what we're looking for when there's a red flag here. So you're going to go investigate it, and I want to know what the deal is. And until you can give me that answer, we're not going to progress. And, and that eliminates a lot of issues on the front. I'd rather have a one-day problem than a four-year problem. And it makes my life a lot easier from a standpoint of managing 112 17 to 22 year old young men 
that aren't the same, but have the same type of vision of wanting to be successful in life. And what I've come across in my time is it's typically not the young man himself, it's who he associates himself with. And, and that's the challenge, is, what, is he willing to step up and understand, you're unique, you have special talents, and not everybody that you've grown up with had those same talents. You've made great choices, you follow direction, but by associating yourself with these young people, they may bring you down. And it might not be in, indirect, it may be just because of jealousy. And that's really hard to deal with when you cut ties with buddies you've been friends with since, since kindergarten. And that's, that's what you have to do, you have to educate them into that real sense. And then, like David said, you talk about Fortune 500 America, how about future father ones? And they're gonna Google you. You know, they're gonna look you up later. I got boys, you know, I mean, I'm lucky you have girls, you know, so. Uh, so my life's pretty easy. I got a fist for those three knuckleheads. So but it, that's that's where we're at today. And it's not changing. It's getting it's getting increasingly more difficult. And it's just about education. Okay. So I'd like that video um, for a number of reasons. I mean, it's, it's right there. There it is. I mean, your digital footprint. And these kids have a lot of pressure on them today because everything they do, they're being recorded. Everything. I, don't, I tell my kids, I don't care if you're in a public bathroom, you just should assume that you're being recorded and it's going to be on the internet later because that's really the world that, that these kids are growing up in. Um, and right, he's right. Future father-in-laws, employers are going to Google you, um, predators are Googling people, colleges are Googling people. I mean, everybody, I Google when I find a bad guy and I'm doing my investigation, the first thing I do one of my first investigative tools is to go to Facebook. I'm Googling that guy, I wanna know. And I find out more from Facebook about people than I do from any law enforcement tool that I have in my toolbox. Um, it's the social media, and just Las Vegas, what just happened. I mean, the media is going crazy because this guy was not on social media. You can't find anything about him, and no one can believe it. Um, but he's just a, you know, he's just one of those strange characters but, that we don't know anything about. But everybody else, we can usually find something about if you look them up on social media. Dating. How many of us have kids who are dating? Okay, well, if you're not, they're going to be there at some point. So this is another quick video on sexting and things that are going on with kids who are dating. Everywhere you turn, people are on their cell phones, especially teens. But they're not just checking in and making plans, they are sexting, a term defined as sending and receiving sexually explicit messages and images. Sexting has become so common, Illinois teens have faced legal consequences. Within the past three years, there have been a number of high-profile sexting cases that have rocked local communities. In 2015, four students at Joliet Central High School were charged with child pornography after posting a sex video on the popular social media site, Twitter. That same year, at Ridgewood High School in Norridge, four teens were arrested after two female students shared new photos of themselves with their male classmates, who distributed them to others. Most of the statistics that I've read when researching it indicate that one in five kids participates in some form of sexting, and that's a really shocking statistic. Mark Hagler, clinical director and community youth network in North Suburban Grays Lake, provides court-ordered counseling to teens involved in sexting incidents. They don't even realize that if they're capturing something, uh, nudity um, of themselves or somebody else, and that person below 18, that now you've entered into child pornography range. While sex day can be a serious crime, Royal County State's Attorney James Glasgow says first-time offenders appearing in juvenile court are typically charged with misdemeanors and ordered to seek counseling and court supervision. Those criminal laws that are on the books are going to stay, but we don't want to criminalize these juveniles who are experimenting uh, on the internet and with their phones. Uh, because if you're a registered sex offender for the rest of your life, you basically are done. The Will County State's Attorney's Office has a team of experts who work with schools to educate kids on the dangers of sexting. They say the key is prevention, not criminal prosecution. Children today have a much different attitude towards relationships and sex because they've been exposed to so much at a young age. But it doesn't change the fact that they, they need be more mature and more life experiences before they venture into that area. 
That area now includes popular video and instant messaging apps like Snapchat, Kick, and Whisper, which make it even easier for teens to distribute sexually explicit images through their phones. Some of them are even using vault apps designed to hide content from onlookers. Sarah Buchek is a lawyer for the Illinois Association of School Administrators and works as an advisor to schools facing sexting cases. She says schools must have up-to-date policies and educate students on the risks of sexting. I think that it's much more widespread um, than we would like, um, but I think that with the enhancement and the engagement of school districts in being proactive, I think we will eventually see this become something where students have a better grasp of what it is. We spoke to a group of teens who say sexting has become the norm. I think adults do kind of make too much out of it because some, it's, for us it's common, but for adults it's like because they're older and like things like that didn't happen when they were young. calculators, um, you might want to ask why are there two calculators on your phone? Um, and maybe one of those is a vault app that they were just talking about. So usually those are, are hidden applications that looks like a calculator or sometimes it looks like a camera um, and then that's where these hidden pictures are. Um, but I do want to say too, we used to, when we did these talks, we used to talk about um, spyware and um, connecting to the cloud and getting all your kids text messages and their photos and everything else and those are just like apps they change all the time and just like applications change so you might buy spyware today and tomorrow seven more apps may come out and your spyware isn't picking up those apps so um, we've kind of changed our talk up and to more of an open and honest approach because no matter how much we think that we're smarter than our kids, they, they are smarter than us when it comes to technology. I mean, they're always gonna find a way. I can ask my daughter to give me her password, she can give me her password, and two days later, or the minute she turns around for me, she can turn around and change her password in her phone. And, I mean, I, I don't like to think that she would do that, um, but I think when we sit down and we go over it, we really wanna know it's not really about getting them in trouble or catching them doing something wrong. It's more about, I just want to know who you are. I want to know what you're about. I want to know who your friends are. I want to know what you talk about. And, you know, I want, I want to be a part of your life. And so I think if we change our way of thinking, um, I think that we're going to be a lot better off. Okay. And the next is Amanda Todd. How many of us have heard of Amanda Todd before? How many have seen the video on Amanda Todd? Anybody? You've seen it? A couple people? Okay, I'm going to show the video. It's an eight minute video. It seems like it's 20 minutes, but it's eight. It's really important and it's near and dear to my heart because Amanda Todd is, to me, she's everybody's kid. Um, this all started when she was 12 years old. Um, she went through a three year period. It was back in 2009. Um, and now we have, how many people have musically? Their kids around musically, sixth graders, seventh graders. I don't realize musically. Okay, so back in 2009, we didn't have musically. We had YouTube, and Justin Bieber had just made it out there, and so everybody was on YouTube making music videos. That's what she liked to do, um, and she went online because she was getting bullied at school. She was a learning disabled, um, but not not bad. But she just, you know, kids picked on her. So what she did was 17 million people. Um, viewed her video. She made a YouTube video in 2012 and she talked about this bullying story and, and it's her story and the the video went viral and now she happens to be our poster child for cyberbullying, for internet predators and, and everything else. So I'm going to show the video and this is this video I showed kids too and when I walked to school.
pretty sad video, huh? So I show that to um, all the kids when I go to schools. And what, I, what I'd like to know now is, did anybody, the last post-it note, she said, my name is Amanda Todd. But does anybody remember what the post-it note prior to that last one said? Anybody remember? Go ahead. That's right. You get a challenge point. Um, she said, I, I don't have anybody and I need somebody. And, and really, that's all. So a month after she made this video, she committed suicide. Um, and she's 15 years old. And I've got a 12-year-old, and that, that could be my daughter, you know? And, and on the flip side, it could also be my daughter who wrote all those bad things about her too, right? So those are our kids. I mean, this is so close to home for me, and it should be close to home for all of you. And we don't know what the person next to us went through this morning or is going through. And so what I'd like you all to do, oh, she made a mistake, and so she's not with us anymore. So I'd like you all to just close your eyes and think about the worst mistake you've ever made in your entire life. And then I'd like you to think about if you had to tell somebody that mistake, who would you tell? Do you have somebody that you support, that would support you, that you can trust, and that's going to help you get out of this mistake? And I'd also like you to think about the last person that you would tell, because we all know somebody that we would never tell that mistake to, because that person is mean and would exploit you and make you feel bad about it. And so that's what we're dealing with. And then I ask you, where do you fall on that spectrum? Are you a good friend? And if somebody needed you, would you be there for that person? Or are you one of those people that just makes fun of people and, and, and nothing, you don't care about anybody but yourself? And so what I, what I say to kids when we talk about this is, where do you fall on that spectrum? And if you're here and you're a mean kid and you think that's funny, you know, do you want to wake up and, and be the one that's responsible or feel that you're responsible for somebody taking their life or, or just even feeling bad? So if you're here on this mean spectrum, let's try and move ourselves up and try to be a little more compassionate, try and find a little more empathy. It goes back to that we got to let our kids have time to daydream and, and feel empathy for each other because it's, it's not happening. I mean, this is real. This could be any one of our kids. Um, so it's, it's serious stuff, and, and I, I don't know other than to show you that video. I met Amanda's Todd's mom. Um, she, she did a training session at one of my trainings, and she still today has not seen this video. She plays the video, and she walks out of the room, and she comes back because she just can't. She can't take it. And she was, she's had her master's degree. She was an educated woman. Um, and she, in 2009, in her mind, she thought that these were just Amanda's peers that were um, doing this to her. When in, in reality, her peers were bullying her, and she was also being stalked online by an adult predator, which nobody knew until later. And I'm going to just show a little news clip um, that kind of gives a brief, it wraps up this story. Exclusive details tonight about a Dutch man who police say bullied and blackmailed Amanda Tom, a British Columbia teenager who killed herself two years ago. Now, as he faces multiple charges here and in the Netherlands, a joint investigation by the Fifth Estate and Dutch TV reveals the staggering details in the case against him, details that point to many more victims. Mark Kelly reports. Hey guys, it's Mana. I'm Lucy. Like so many teenagers today, Amanda Todd lived much of her life online, making music videos, making new friends, but she would also make a mistake that had tragic consequences. The BC teen was urged to flash her breasts while people were watching online, and that's when a man calling himself Tyler Boo would pounce. He lived in the Netherlands, an ocean away but connected by the internet. Using her topless image, he would blackmail and bully her online for the two years leading up to her suicide. Little was known about Tyler Boo until earlier this year when Dutch police arrested a man named Aiden Coban. We now know that much of the case against him is built on a report by investigators from Facebook, an internal report obtained by the Fifth Estate. The findings are astonishing. 
Facebook's investigation claims the online stalker was using more than 90 different screen names and 86 different Facebook accounts to prey upon his victims. And his victims were many, according to the report. The suspect targeted more than 75 individual victims from around the world, though that number is likely to grow. As the investigation continues, the Fifth Estate has learned police are investigating 10 other victims here in Canada. The report also reveals details about how the stalker would torment Amanda, not only on Facebook, but on YouTube and online chat groups, demanding she strip for him online or hit send her topless picture to her family and friends. You still think you're dealing with an amateur? You have until the end of the day before all hell breaks loose. So, three shows of 15 minutes and then I won't send. For a while, Amanda was defiant. Not gonna happen. Do you want to meet me? Come meet me right now. Or are you too scared? We showed the Facebook report to Amanda's mother, Carol Todd. It's a sick person. It's, it's someone that's preying on innocent children, right? Someone who knew what he was doing. Kovac's lawyer says his client is no internet predator. He's uh, 36 years old, Turkish Dutch uh, citizen. Uh, a calm and uh, decent person, as I know him. The charges against Coban include extortion, internet luring, and criminal harassment, though they only relate to three of his alleged victims. His trial is expected to begin next year. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. And Mark's full report, Stalking Amanda Todd, The Man in the Shadows, will air tomorrow on the 5th Estate, 9 p.m. on CBC Television. That's 9.30 in Newfoundland. So the fifth estate is kind of like our 60 minutes in Canada. And if you go on YouTube and you Google Amanda Todd, the fifth estate, um, there's a 40 minute documentary if you're interested. It kind of tells the whole story about her. Uh, we just don't have all that time um, for me to show it tonight. Um, but I would like to just go over just a few things. Um, so I already went over trades. I told you what that is. And Snapchat. I just want to briefly talk about Snapchat. So your kids may tell you Snapchat goes away after five seconds, but you know that, if you don't know, I'm telling you now that somebody can take a screenshot of their picture even though it fades out. And it used to be where you would get a message saying that person just took a screenshot. It doesn't really matter because the guy or the girl has the screenshot. Um, and now there are um, applications that hide that message that gets sent to Snapchat. So. Um, you, you won't necessarily get a message back on Snapchat that says somebody just took a screenshot. So just know that anytime you put an inappropriate picture out there, somebody could potentially grab that picture and it's out there forever. Um, the other thing about Snapchat is you want to make sure that your child has it in ghost mode. Um, Snapchat just came out with a feature that if it's not in ghost mode, it has a GPS locator on it. So you can Whoever is following your child on Snapchat can actually, if they do not have it in ghost mode, they can see where your child is located at any time that they're on that application. Um, and then if you're going over your phone with your child, ask them, how many likes did you get today? So we all know that that's, what, that's what's important to them is likes. And find out who's liking their photos and who's liking their comments and make sure that they actually know those people in real life. But those are kids that they're going to school with and it's not somebody that they don't know. Um, their followers, who's following you? And once again, do you know them? Do you know those people? Are they real people that you've met before? Are they your friends? If not, how do you know them? And last but not least, so the Musical.ly people or Facebook or YouTubers. So Musical.ly, we've had problems. Because what happens, how many, how many people, their daughters are musically, okay, where do they make their musically videos? Usually. Bedroom, that's right. And so, right, why do they go in their bedroom to make their videos? Because they want to be in private, they're going to lip sync, they're going to make this video. But what they don't realize is what's on their bedroom wall when they're making their video, right? Sometimes they have um, certificates that may say Plainfield Grade School, home of the Tigers and it has their name, you know, Chelsea Smith. So if I'm a predator, I'm going to not necessarily zoom in on Chelsea, I'm going to zoom in on that and I'm going to find out, now I know where she goes to school and I know her name. Even if 
her musically name is something different, um, they can find out a lot. Their t-shirts, they're wearing their school shirt. I can find out where you go to school because you've got your school shirt on. Um, and if you go on Facebook, even us as adults, what can I find out about you? I find when I go on to stop a predator after I find out who it is, I sometimes I can find out where they work because they have a shirt on that says Ford Motor Company or whatever. Um, I can find out if they have pets in the house. Sometimes they're taking um, pictures inside their house at Christmas. I can kind of see the layout of the house. I can find out how many kids they have. Find out if they're married, if they're single. I read their whole profile. So just go on your your social media and find out if you were if you didn't know yourself, what could you find out without ever talking to somebody just by looking at their social media. It's kind of interesting little um, exercise. Um, Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Just a few things to wrap up before we go. Um, we do have, we will have this entire session on a podcast, so for your husbands or wives or friends that you want them to see this presentation, it will be on our website. Um, within the uh, flyer here, we do have some information how to get some of the handouts that are also very valuable, both in English and Spanish, that talk about the websites and the, and the applications and the uh, social media. So you can either use your phone through the QR code or go to our website, Plainfield Parent Community Network.org, to get some of that information. Also, within your flyer here is a survey. We use this information um, to help develop our series of speakers throughout the school year. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out and then leaving it at the front table for us. Again, we go through all this information and use it to, uh, to better serve our committee. Um, speaking of committees, I want to just thank um, the people on the Parent Plainfield Community Network uh, Committee, Christine Belcastro, wave in the back, Counselor at Plainfield East, um, Kathy Bertrand, social worker at Indian Trail, Jenny Hamby, uh, parent in the community, uh, Nicole Nepper, is over there and she is with Ride the Wave uh, Wellness. Uh, Brian Sword, principal at Meadowview, could be here tonight. And then Corey Warden in the back over there from Plainfield uh, Counseling Center. So thank you to them. Um, our next event will be January 18th. We have tentatively scheduled um, that event to be around the idea of overscheduled kids and what the impact that has on them. I have a parent who agreed they're running crazy, going in a million different directions and what that means for us as parents, but more importantly, what that means for our kids. So please keep that date in mind, January 18th. Um, and then the last remaining time is yours. We have vendors in the back that have come out to give us good information. Again, thank you for coming out tonight.